Hi, I'm Steve Wells, President of Los Alamos National Bank. As Los Alamos National Bank celebrates its 50th anniversary, we've always strived to be the kind of bank that a great community like Los Alamos deserves. We're very proud to bring you Behind the White Coat, a series that explains the great science and engineering that's going on at the Los Alamos National Laboratories. Thank you. Hello, I'm Carol Clark with the Los Alamos Daily Post. We want to welcome you to Behind the White Coat Conversations with Los Alamos Scientists. And my guest today is <clears throat> Avad Saxena, and he is a physicist at Los Alamos National Laboratory. He has worked there for 24 years, and um, he works in solid state physics and materials physics. Welcome to the program. Thank you. And uh, you're, you work in the theoretical division yes. at Lanel? Um, now, you were born in India in what town? In Jodhpur, Rajasthan. And how did you end up, wh where did you go to school and... and uh, okay, so let me start from the beginning, okay. how I got into science. My father was a professor of zoology, and in India, when you, in summer, it's hot, you have a roof, you go and sleep on the roof. But sometimes you sleep inside the room and it's hot, so you have ceiling fans. So I often ask my father, how does the ceiling fan create air? And my father said, you look at the blades. Uh, wh what do you see different at the blades? And I said, oh, they are not flat, they are tilted. He says, this is by rotating, it's cutting the air and that's how it creates air. Then a few days later, I was sleeping on the roof and I saw this big wind coming. And I woke up my father, where is this big fan which is creating this wind? And my father said, now I have to introduce you to a different concept. When there's a hot region somewhere, and there's a cold region somewhere, the air flows from hot to cold. And that's how this wind is created. So I thought that was very cool. And I got hooked in understanding the phenomena in nature. So at a very early age, I was hooked on understanding nature, and that is physics. So up to my high school in India, uh, I did science, mathematics, and physics, and then I was selected at very young age, about 15 or so, as national science talent. And so I was given a scholarship, understanding that this person would become a future scientist. But I also had an interest in electronics, how everything worked in electronics. So there are places in India which are called Indian Institute of Technology, or IITs, which are premier places for engineering, undergrad engineering. But there's another place in India called BITS, Birla Institute of Technology and Science, which allowed to pursue both science and engineering. So I decided to go there, and I did both science and engineering simultaneously and got two degrees. Wow. Uh, electro uh, undergrad BS in electronics and master's in physics. And then I came over to the United States, and I went to Temple University. This was just a coincidence. Temple University? Yes. And I did PhD there, and after that I did postdoc at Penn State and Cornell combined. PhD in physics. PhD in physics. And then I did a postdoc at uh, Penn State University and Cornell combined, and this was in material science. And after that, uh, in January 1990, I came to the lab as a consultant because those days Cold War was still on and people from Russia, China, India, and other sensitive countries could not come here Old as employees. Cold War. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I came here as a consultant for eight months to begin with, with theoretical division. And I worked with Alan Bishop, who is now the principal associate director for the lab, science and technology. And you, you came as a consultant in the theoretical, theoretical division, division to work on a particular project? Yes. I, yes. Uh, on what are called uh, charge density wave or electronic materials which are one dimensional. Okay. Not three dimensional crystal, but one dimensional, and trying to understand the electronic properties of those materials. That's how I got into the lab. When I was a consultant, the international political landscape changed. And in, I think, August 1991, the Soviet Union changed. I was still c continuing as a consultant. So they had to do a lot of paperwork, and then 
I became a staff member. Uh, and then what was- In what year? This was beginning of 1993, so I was consultant for three years when everything Starting was- Starting out at eight months, but it led yeah, to three years three. because things changed. Sure. And so then I became a staff member in 1993, and then I was a staff member until uh, 2005. 2006, I became the deputy group leader of that group, which was called Condensed Matter Physics and Statistical Physics. So I did that for three years, and for the last five years, I'm the group leader of a combined much larger group, which is called Condensed Matter and Complex Systems. So, so I'm leading a group of uh, scientists in, in varied areas. And this group is still in the it's still, and it is And it is division. called T4. D4. No, uh -huh. T, T4. Oh. T4 for T4. theoretical case. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Great. So, and and so you've been doing this for five years now? Yes. And can you talk to us a little bit about some of the research or projects that are interesting? Okay. So there are many projects in the group, and group is a combination of different kind of scientists. So there are people who do some very fundamental science, and something like the foundations of quantum mechanics, all the way to understanding solar cells, but it is all theoretical. We do not do experiments, but we either try to understand experiments or do modeling or predict new experiments to understand different phenomena. So I have myself been involved in several things, but I want to bring one concept, what I will call topology. This comes from mathematics, but we are trying to get into the mainstream material science. So let me explain what topology is and why it's so interesting. Topology. Topology, not topography. Topography is how the landscape is. Uh -huh. Topology is a concept in mathematics, but it's extremely useful in physics. But we are now trying to get this into material physics. So let me explain what topology is. Topology is geometry, but elastic geometry. For instance, if I take a rubber band, the geometry of rubber band is a circle. But suppose I put these four fingers and stretch the rubber band, this would look like a square. So the geometry of a square is different than a circle, but I, I was able to continuously deform it, deform the circle to make it uh, a square. A square. So geometrically, a square and a circle are distinct, but topologically, they are identical. That means I can take one object and continuously deform into each other. Well, I know that this weekend is a Super Bowl weekend, so the uh, American football is what I would call an ellipsoidal shape, and European soccer is a sphere. Mm -hmm. but, but I can continuously deform a sphere and make it look like an American football. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the American football and a sphere are topologically same, but geometrically distinct. But a sphere or ball is not the same as donut, because I can never stretch, never stretch football to make it look like donut unless I puncture it. So. So therefore, a donut and a ball are topologically uh, distinct. They are geometrically distinct, but also topologically distinct. Now, this is very important in many, many places in science. I give you a very simple example. Suppose you have some electrical circuit. Let's just take a circle. And suppose the circle is made out of a copper wire, and current is passing through it, OK? Whatever current. Now, I can deform this. Uh, uh, s copper wire circle in as many ways, current will remain the same. That means current is a topological invariant. The, the amount of current does not change whatever uh, topology. I, I, I deform the geometry, but the topology is the same. So this is extremely important concept, so much so that uh, high energy physicists and cosmologists are thinking about what is the topology of the universe. Is it a sphere, a spheroid, is it a donut? Because think of, a, suppose, think of uh, our universe as a balloon. And there, there are all these galaxies on this. So we know that the galaxies are moving apart. That means this balloon a sphere is growing, the distance between two galaxies. But suppose this balloon was not a sphere, it had a different topology. It was some kind of donut-like balloon, which had a hole. So then one would think that some galaxies would appear to be going apart, and some coming closer. So you see how topology affects even the nature and the shape of our universe. And we do not know that answer absolutely even now. Similarly, in biology, you know, in our cells have something called vesicles, which can be donut shape, which can be spherical shape, and affects how the body functions. Sometimes the diseases may depend on that. 
Similarly, a variety of materials have different topology in nanoscience, nanotechnology, whether you have tiny particles which are spherical, ring shaped or something else. So, we are trying to get this abstract notion of mathematics of topology into mainstream material science and use it to explain some properties. So, that is one of the things I am involved with to take the abstract concept all the way and to apply it to something more tangible. So, th that is something I am involved in. Uh, mm -hmm. there's there is something else I, I'm involved in, and that is trying to uh, what we call shape memory alloys. Shape memory. And let me explain. You must have seen people wearing these orthodontic wires, braces, braces, and also some people wearing glasses whose frames you can deform and yes. they open up. Yes. So, certain materials at one given temperature have a certain shape. Suppose I take a wire of this material. Suppose I cool it below a certain temperature which we call phase transition temperature and I deform it as what, whichever way I want. If I heat it up, it remembers the shape at high temperature and this is called shape memory and I will give you some example. So, suppose I take this material and uh, this wire and make a butterfly out, out of it. Okay? So, at high temperature it, the shape is a butterfly, then I cool it down and stretch it, it becomes a wire. And I can show you, not here, if I throw this wire back into the water, it beca automatically becomes a butterfly. That means it remembers its shape. Uh -huh. Now, this is, this is tremendous applications in many, many cases. Suppose uh, your windows, uh, you want to you have the shades, depending on where the sun is, it should adjust the loose. So, this is used in opening windows. Suppose you want to s send a satellite, huge satellite, up there or some antenna on a satellite. So, if you send a huge antenna, it is very unwieldy, but you can make an antenna of this kind of material, crumple it in a ball, put it on a satellite, it goes up, the solar radiation heats it above certain temperature, it remembers that it must open. Mm -hmm. And this has many other applications. You know, many people who have high cholesterol or cardiac problems have um, blockage in their arteries. So, you, this is now established medical technology, you make stents, stents out of this material, these wires, these are basically nickel titanium kind of alloys and you insert into your arteries and because of the heat, where your body heat it opens up and it can declog. Mm -hmm. In fact, I knew a scientist in California who is working on this topic. He was in his 70s going to his office and had a heart attack and suddenly had to go to hospital and they inserted the shape memory stent into a, his heart. In few weeks, days, I mean, few days later, I spoke with him on the phone. He says, my research saved me. The shape memories in my blood now. <laughs> so, it is very interesting. And similarly, there are many <coughs> other topics and uh, it is fun uh, to interact with different scientists around the world on different kind of ideas. Uh, and I do interact with many experimentalists around the world. We exchange ideas and we continue to do research of different sort. And, um, so, um, when you were over in India, mm -hmm. do, you, do you go back very often? Okay, so I typically go every two years to see my mother and family. And the last three, four years, three years, <coughs> I've been going every Christmas because my mother is now about 80, so I want to see her, yes. Uh -huh. And um, do you ever collaborate with people over in India? Not directly, only those who visit here in the lab from India from time to time, yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, um, we have a little time left. Mm -hmm. Is there another uh, uh, project or some research you could talk to us about? Okay, so le let me think about uh, what may be interesting to a broader audience. Uh, so, phase transitions I talked about, phase transitions. So, let me give you what I mean by phase transition. You have Greenland and you know, you know the glaciers are splitting from Greenland. So, a glacier is sitting on the surface of the ocean, but glacier can also become vapor. So, vapor, liquid water and ice are coexisting. So, liquid becoming vapor or ice becoming water is what we call phase transition, change in phase of a material, but that is not just confined to ice. This happens in all kinds of materials. And so, whenever something happens, uh, so, a crystal structure changes. In the case of water, it was uh, water, go, you know, ice going to uh, vapor or 
or, or ice going to water, water going to vapor. But in real material, crystal, if you look at inside the crystal, there's a microscopic structure, the atoms are arranged in a very particular fashion. So below a certain temperature, this uh, crystal structure changes from one kind to another and that phase transition changes the property. Sometimes the metal can become like wood insulating and this has many, many applications. So my physics is to be able to understand that phenomena taking into account the symmetry of the crystal and that's another key point. Symmetry is the key point. So building the symmetry of that crystal structure in a model can explain a lot of things which are observed and the change in properties. You can have a material which was shining and suddenly below a certain temperature it starts become dark or you know, so that's a field I've sp spent a lot of time with and has a lot of applications. Um. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me ask you about when, when you were back in school, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that at the age of 15 you won some type of a science talent, talent. science talent, national science talent scholarship. And and how did you win that? Okay, so those days, now I'm talking of the late 70s or so, those days um, in India they will have in each state a competition. So first you win the state competition and so people who had natural talent or natural inkling for science, uh, there will be very open questions, not part of your curriculum and you answer those questions and then if they are selected. Then there was a competition, India-wide competition. First it was a written test and then they would select uh, thousands so from all over India and they would interview them. And in my time, 320 from all over India were selected. And by the way, there are a couple of other scientists in the lab from that time from India who are scientists here. Here at Los Alamos. Uh, here at Los Alamos. So it's uh, very interesting that how early they could see the seeds of future scientists. Uh, that, that was amazing. Amazing. And um, and so you picked the particular school to go to, uh, the particular university, in the U.S. Yes. Okay. I will tell you that little story. So, I was a student there when I applied. This is 1982 to United States. Most universities would want thirty-five dollars as application fee, and I had many many admissions. But $35 for me was a lot of money at that time. Not now, at that time. Temple University w said, we will give you full fellowship, everything, you just come. Temple University yes. said that. Yeah. Waive yeah. the application Everything, uh, even uh, fellowships, whatever you want. Other universities said, you come and you can still pay. So I came to Temple University and after that I wanted to move. But uh, my professor who had talked to me, he says, you stay here and I will master your brain. So that's how it happened. And I said, look, if I want to become a professor at a good university, I want to go to top 10 university something. And he said one thing, if you're really good, this will not matter in the long term. And I have thanked him for doing that. His name is Jim Gunton, and it's very interesting. His claim to fame is very different. He was uh, a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, and he shared his uh, room that time with the Superman, Christopher Reeves. Christopher Reeves. Reeves. So uh -huh. later he became dean at Lehigh University and he was extremely popular. He says so sad that the students, undergraduate students did not care about his science but he says the dean knows the Superman. <laughs> so there are many stories. <laughs> uh, and what was his name? Uh, Jim Gunton. G-U-N-T-O-N. Jim Gunton. Gunton. Yeah, Jim Gunton. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and you ended up going to Cornell and Penn yeah, State? Yeah, so after that I had a joint postdoc at Penn State and Cornell. So the Penn State professor was Gerhard Barsch, originally from Göttingen, where all the quantum physics took place in Germany. And the person at Cornell was Jim Krumhansel, who was also advisory on the advisory board for the lab's theoretical division otherwise, and also the former president of American Physical Society. So I had the chance to work with very distinguished people, and then Alan Bishop here. So it all adds up. If I might add if, uh, one more thing, when I was young, uh, my father died very young, but my sister, my second sister, was very talented, and she became a professor at a very young age, a professor of zoology. So. Apart from my father, there was tremendous influence, intellectual influence on me for, of my sister uh, in terms of knowledge. And I asked all kinds of questions. They never said why, they simply answered. So that was extremely important in my choosing a path to science that no question is stupid. In fact, 
there is no such thing as stupid question. And as we say in mathematics, there is nothing obvious you have to prove. Similarly, in, in science, you have to ask the right question and keep asking, and there is no limit. Well, Avad Saxena, it's been a pleasure to have you on the program. Likewise, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us on Behind the White Coat, Conversations with Los Alamos Scientists. Thank you. Science. Science. Science.